Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce the um, keynote speaker uh, for tonight, Dr. Daniel Haber. Dr. Haber is a professor at Mass General and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and it's fantastic to have you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll start with an apology that I have a cold and I've lost my voice, so I won't be quite as melodious as I usually am, but hopefully I won't have to resort to being a mime uh, for the rest of this talk. So I will be talking about circulating tumor cells. I do have disclosures. Tell Bio is actually the new, co the new, bio, the new uh, biotech company that we're just launching to commercialize this technology. So please wish it well and wish us well as well. Um, the world of liquid biopsies is kind of illustrated here. And basically, liquid biopsies can do just about anything that you ever want. Um, most of the, over the last, over the past few years, we've seen a lot of work on pl circulating plasma DNA, focused primarily on DNA mutations and abnormalities in cancer. And what I'll focus on for this talk are the kinds of things that you can't do with uh, circulating DNA, namely looking at RNA, transcripts, protein, as well as I'll focus on for today's talk on culture of these circulating tumor cells from the blood of patients with cancer. So circulating cells are basically cancer cells that extravasate into the blood, that intravasate into the blood uh, circulation, travel for periods of time, usually a few minutes, sometimes longer, through the circulation, and then ultimately extravasate into distant tissues. The vast, vast majority of these cells will die in the circulation, but some of them are viable, and that's how cancer spreads to give rise to bloodborne uh, metastases. There are many things you can do. I'll focus today on understanding bloodborne metastasis, but I should note that you can also use CTCs to non-invasively non monitor cancer during therapy, particularly if you're looking at signaling pathways. And you can also apply it for earlier detection of locally invasive cancers. And it does turn out that early cancers that are invasive will shed cells into the blood long before any of them can give rise to a metastasis. So again, there's an opportunity for earlier detection using this kind of approach. Let me turn first to the technology that we're using. This is a tube of blood. 10 mils of whole blood has billions of red blood cells, millions of white blood cells, and anywhere from zero to 100 CTCs. So you can see the challenge, and this has been really the biggest problem in the field that has limited the field so far, is the technological difficulty of purifying these cells. We've had the pleasure for the last 15 years of collaborating with a fantastic bioengineer, Mehmet Toner at MGH, who's developed a number of these microfluidic devices, and this is the currently most advanced technology that we have. And it relies on what's called negative depletion, which means that instead of using an antibody to pick out EBCAM or some other tumor-associated cell surface marker, you deplete all the white blood cells and all the normal cells, and you leave behind the untagged CTCs. The advantage of this is that all cancers are different from one another, but pretty much all of our white blood cells are the same, and there's some very, very good antibodies. But you then have the challenge that you have to get rid of billions of normal white cells to find the one CTC. So you're kind of giving, getting rid of the hay to find the needle in the haystack, if you will. The way this works is that we add antibodies to white blood cells conjugated with magnetic beads to a tube of blood. The first part of this chip just gets rid of very small red cells and platelets <laughs> by size, and then through this process, which is wiggling channels of different sizes, basically the, si the diameter of the, of, the, of, the, of the channel and the curvature can be adjusted so that it forces cells into the middle. And once cells are in the middle, they end up being single file. And once they're rushing by at a million cells per second in single file, a single magnetic particle is enough to deflect these cells as they go through a magnetic channel. So this kind of lining up of the cells and then magnetophoresis is what achieves a 10 to the 4 purification. So by the end of this, we end up, depending on the number of CTCs in the sample, with anywhere from 0.1 to 1% CTCs in the final product. This is what it looks like now. This, is being, this can be mass produced with the three components that I talked about. And this is what it looks like. It fits into this cartridge. The cartridge fits right here into the machine red cells, white cells, and CTCs, and you push a button that says on, and then it takes about an hour to process a tube of blood. So I'm gonna talk about a couple highlights of the work that we've already published to give you a sense of, of capabilities of CTCs, and then for the second half of the talk, I'll talk about some unpublished work that we find very intriguing. So the first thing you can do is you've, you've now enriched for these rare CTCs, 
You can stain them viably with self-surface fluorescent conjugated antibodies, and you can pick them. So this is the old-fashioned style of doing single-cell RNA-seq. You pick the cell, and then you do RNA-seq. And the kinds of things you can find, David Miyamoto, when he was in lab, was studying antigen receptor variants. And we all know that different patients have different variants of the antigen receptor. What you'll find by single-cell RNA sequencing of CTCs in prostate cancer is that a given patient can have multiple different splice variants. And in fact, a single cell can have multiple different splice variants. We've looked at wind signaling, particularly non-canonical wind signaling pathways. The work of, and this was done by Min Yu, when she was in the lab, David Ting has shown that in pancreatic cancer, the CTCs will express ECM proteins as if they're pretending to be stromal cells. They'll secrete a fair amount of, uh, extra, of ECM proteins. Um, and then more recently, we focus on antioxidant pathways because, again, remember that the blood is a very, very oxygen-rich environment with a fair amount of RS stress. One of the, this is the, one of the pictures I like the most. This was done by Min Yu when she was a postdoc. She now has her own lab at USC. And she developed an RNA in situ assay with panels of mesenchymal and panels of epithelial markers to stain CTCs in individual patients during the course of treatment. And the first thing you'll notice, red here is epithelial, blue is mesenchymal. You'll see that the same patient goes up and down in terms of the epithelial versus mesenchymal component of their CTCs. And what you'll notice is that it's really affected by treatment. So if you have a treatment that works and the patient responds, the number of CTCs drops and they become more, more epithelial. As the cancer becomes resistant, the number of CTCs rises and they become more mesenchymal again. And if you find another drug that works, you can kill the cells and again you become more epithelial. So again, there are many interesting components of the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. This is really a kind of drug-induced shift that you see in a given patient. You can also look at signaling within CTCs and this is something that we've done now to make it easier than having to pick the cells and look at them under the microscope. You can take the enriched CTC population, mush it up, purify RNA, and do droplet RNA-seq, or do RNA-seq on, on the mixture. In this case, we're doing droplet uh, RT-PCR. And what you can see in breast cancer is that if you have CTCs and they drop with treatment, you're gonna respond better than if they don't. But more importantly than that, you can find all of these breast-specific transcripts in the CTCs, and the ones in red here are the ones that are regulated by signaling by the estrogen receptor. And if these guys go down on treatment, your drug has hit the target, and you're suppressing ER signaling within breast CTCs, and you're on the blue curve. If, on the other hand, these ER signaling signatures are still present, despite the fact that you're getting an anti-hormonal therapy, then you're on the red curve, and you will not do as well. So you can actually measure signaling at the RNA level within CTCs as a function of treatment and see whether you suppress the pathway that you're trying to suppress. <coughs> now, one of the kind of most, and that's something that I'll come back to at the end of the talk, one of the interesting features if you isolate CTCs that way is that they're not only single cells, they also come in clusters. This is one of the more pretty pictures that we uh, obtained from, this is Shannon Stott's picture with a number of CTCs in green and you'll notice a couple red cells in red that are stuck to this. Now, clusters are a little scary because how do they happen? This is a picture of the capillaries, if you will, and if a tumor sheds cells, these cells travel um, first into the right side of the heart, and from there they go through the capillaries in the lungs to the left side of the heart, down to the capillaries in your fingers, and out of the, to the main veins in your arm from which we draw the blood. So how do these large cells, and you can see anything from two clusters of two cells to we've seen 50 or 100 cells tethered together, how do they travel through the vasculature? And this is work by Sam Oh, who was a postdoc in Mamitona's lab, now has his own lab in Hong Kong. And you'll see under physiological capillary pressures with physiological dimensions, what you'll see is a cluster coming through, and then they squeeze. And they squeeze and they squeeze, and then they come through and I won't, let you sh I won't show the whole film, but to, say it, to, to, to summarize at the end, they come out looking like a hot dog um, of a long stretch of cells, and given time, they then reconstitute themselves as a cluster of CTCs. So these CTCs will either get stuck in the capillaries uh, and initiate a metastasis, or they come through, and they can come through multiple beds of capillaries and come out the other side. Um, again, if you study cell 
matrix adhesions, it can be a little weird to look at. Now, work that was done by Nicola Aceto when he was in the lab, he now has his own lab at University of Basel, was quite elegant work in terms of trying to figure out the origin of CTCs. And what he did was to basically label some CTCs in green and some in red, and then he played around with injecting them into the mammary fat pad, either one tumor that was green and one that was red on opposite sides, or one tumor that was mixed and had both of these. And you could tell that all the single CTCs were one color, but the vast majority of clusters were of single color in this case, multicolors in that case. So rather than aggregating in the blood, um, which is another possibility, or in the machine, which is another possibility, what we presume is that these clusters are actually, they come from bits of the tumor that break off and then somehow spill into the blood. It turns out that there are a number of markers that are overexpressed in these clusters of CTCs. One of the key ones is platoglobin, which is part of the, desmo, the, the, the cell adherence junction, and it's increased about 200-fold in these CTCs, and it helps keep them together. If you knock down platoglobin and inject cells into the mammary fat pad, it will create a tumor, no problem, but you will not see clusters, and the number of lung metastases goes down by greater than 90%. So based on that, we would assume that CTCs are relatively, <coughs> CTC clusters are relatively rare, and they reflect the adhesions of groups of cells that either migrate together or kind of, kind of fall into vascular space, but they're much more metastatic competent than single cells. And if you look at the lungs in early stages of metastasis from these CTC clusters, you find much less apoptosis within the lung. So it's as if when cells travel together, they have stronger survival signals in the bloodstream and then when they arrive in the lung. So lastly, what I would say is that we've tried, this is again the work of Min Yu and a clinical oncologist, uh, Aditya Bardia. We've collected, at this point, over 400 samples from women with metastatic breast cancer, mostly hormone receptor positive, and have tried to culture these. Um, it's a labor of love. With current technologies, we're succeeding in about 5% of cases, but primarily in the ones where there are a lot of CTCs and they're between treatments. And you can see these cells grow. They grow in stem cell medium, anchorage independent, and under hypoxic conditions, and they're highly, highly tumorigenic. So 200 of these cells will be enough to give rise to a tumor in the mammary fat pad. You can look at mutations in the CTC-derived cell lines, and you can also confirm that they come from the patient because you can derive the cell lines multiple times from the same patient, and you see the same mutation. And you find the ones that you know are present in the tumor but you also find somatically acquired mutations that arose during the course of treatment. Um, just about, you've heard about ESR1 mutation just about the time that they were discovered. We also found ESR1 mutations repeatedly in patients who had been treated with aerobatase inhibitors, and we now have viable cells that you can study the ESR1 functions. Uh, we've also found activating mutations in interesting genes, FGF receptor, PI3 kinase, and one of the challenges now with plasma DNA is that you find lots of mutations in the plasma of patients, and you don't know which ones are druggable, which ones are important. So if you generate these cell lines, you can actually test them alone or in combinations of drug, in vitro or in mouse models, and you can test whether the mutations that are acquired somatically actually confer susceptibility to cancer. And it's not something we would have assumed, but yes, it turns out you can acquire an FGF receptor, a PI3 kinase mutation. You can also acquire HER2 mutations. And these mutations may confer resistance to hormonal therapy, but they confer sensitivity to the targeted drug which addresses these particular mutations. So finally, um, in terms of the past work, we've also seen that these cells are very, very heterogeneous. So this is, for example, a cell line from one patient and you see two populations. This population proliferates very slowly, and it overexpresses NOTCH, and it tends to be resistant to both chemotherapy and various targeted agents. This population here does not express NOTCH. It expresses HER2 and other RTKs. It proliferates much more quickly, but it's more sensitive to drugs. And if you isolate individual cells from one peak or the other, you can grow them as single-cell clones, and you can see in this case a cell that was HER2 negative acquires HER2 positivity in a subset of the cells as they grow. And this case, in this case here, the cell was HER2 positive initially, and a subset of the cells lost HER2 expression. So it really points to this heterogeneity of these cells, 
and the fact that they can really, at, the, at this level of advanced breast cancer and plasticity, you can see a lot of back and forth in terms of different phenotypes. So let me go back now to um, some unpublished work looking primarily at trying to understand how these cells give rise to metastasis. And particularly in a cancer like breast cancer, where the primary tumor can be resected at one point, and it can recur 5, 10, 15 years later, this whole idea of what triggers metastatic, metastatic invasion, what controls dormancy, is obviously of great interest in this audience. So the first thing that we found was a paradox. And that is that you can take, as I mentioned, 200 of these cultured CTCs, put them in the mammary fat pad, and you give rise to tumors. However, you can inject millions of cells into the tail vein. They all go to the lung, and nothing happens. And they just sit there. And you can actually see that. So if you do that with a classic MDA uh, cell from ATCC, these are highly invasive breast cancer cells. You inject them by tail vein, and they grow in the lung like crazy. These CTCs basically just sit there for up to five months, and nothing happens. And eventually, if you wait long enough, you'll get some ovarian or other metastases, but it takes a very long time. If you look at the lungs, even after a number of months, you just see single cells that sit there in the lung without proliferating. Um, so Richard Ebright, who's a very talented MD-PhD student who just graduated last week, to my, to my horror and dismay, but to his eternal happiness, um, decided to take on an in vivo CRISPR screen with the CTC lines. Now, it would have been easy to do a standard knockout CRISPR screen, but Richard reasoned for two reasons to do a CRISPR activation screen. First, he thought that whatever you activate, you could then suppress, so that would be the better way to study something to suppress metastasis. But the real reason is that these CTC lines are polyploid. They're anywhere from 4N to 6N to 8N, which is a challenge for CRISPR. So what he did was to use the library that was developed by Feng Zhang at the Broad, which, as you see here, combines a number of strong transcriptional activation to guide RNAs, targeting the entire um, transcriptome. Made a pool of those, injected them by tail vein, and then after two months, he collected the lungs and sequenced the guide RNAs. So this was a labor of love. He found a number of repeat hits. He did this in duplicate in two different um, cell lines. And he got some of the usual suspects in terms of pathways. And as he was mining through the data, he started looking for what would be the most interesting thing that nobody could expect. And he landed on translation for some reason that I'll explain to you. But clearly, a subset of the hits were involved in protein translation. And there were a number of those. So there were kind of classic mTOR and other proteins that are established as having a role in translation. But he also found three components, three structural components of the ribosome. The one in red is our favorite, RPL15, which you can see was hit number 10 in the screen. And RPL15, at least in yeast, is an absolute required component of the ribosome. In mammalian cells, we don't know so well because there's so many of these proteins, it's not sure exactly which one fits where. But the other interesting thing with RPL15 and his other two hits, 35 and 13, is that they all interact with each other. They're all here in the large subunit of the ribosome at the polypeptide exit site. So he decided to study this a little bit closer. Now, probably like everybody in the audience, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about ribosomes. But ever since we started working on this, I see them everywhere. And I would point out, for any of you who actually have gone to your dorm, that there are waltzing ribosomes right outside this hall. And you just can't escape the stuff. So the first thing that Richard did was actually to take the, the CTC cell lines and knock down um, RPL15, which is the key uh, ribosomal component that we're looking at. You can see uh, he, I'm sorry, he, the first thing he did was to overexpress it. And you can see threefold overexpression of RPL15. And you can see by tail vein injection that it has a dramatic effect in terms of lung and ultimately ovarian metastases in this model. These are the other uh, ribosomal components that are more attenuated in their effect than RPL15. It, and I should say that RPL15 does absolutely nothing to the in vitro growth of these cells. But by tail vein, it has quite an impressive effect. You can also make primary orthotopic mammary tumors with RPL15 overexpression. You see a little bit more growth, but it's not really impressive. But again, if you look at the spontaneous lung metastasis following an orthotopic mammary tumor, you see a very significant increase in lung mets 
from the, the CTC lines overexpressing RPL15. And if you look histologically, you see an increase both in the number of lesions in the lungs as well as the number of cells per lesion. So you see an increase in the number of kind of micrometastases, if you will, triggered by RPL15. Now, if you inject the CTC directly into the heart as opposed to into the tail vein, you get lesions that appear everywhere, so you have a much more positive uh, background. And if you do that and you knock down RPL15, two different shRNAs with different levels of knockdown, you suppress the metastases uh, that you see um, by total body imaging in the mouse after intracardiac injection. And I should point out, this will come out later, but you can see here, you're knocking down 90% of the RPL15 in the cell, at least at the RNA level, and in vitro, these cells proliferate absolutely perfectly. So again, it suggests that this may be a fac facultative or maybe not an essential component of the ribosome in mammalian cells, at least in the context of in vitro growth. So at this point, we collaborated with another faculty member at MGA, Shobha Vasudevan, who actually knows what a ribosome looks like and studies RNA for a living, and her postdoc, Charlie Yi, and we set up a, an experiment to try to figure out how are these uh, transcripts differentially protected by ribosomes in cells overexpressing RPL15 versus controls. So the way you do this basically is you harvest the ribosomes and RNAs digest all the free RNA, all the free RNA uh, transcripts and you're left with those protected by the ribosomes. And you can see on this map here, the total RNA is featured here and the ribosomal pr uh, protected fragments are shown here. So the first thing that we found was actually that RPL15 leads to increased translation of all the other ribosomal structural proteins itself. So what you can see in this drawing here, this is the total RNA in the cell comparing RPL15 overexpressing to control cells. And you can see there's really no change in the total level of RNA for these structural components. But in red below, you can see the ribosomal protected uh, sequences, and they're highly enriched. So what we're seeing here is that overexpression of RPL15 seems to increase the translation of all the other ribosomal components because these are very, very tightly coordinated in terms of their translation. The other feature that we observed is the E2F pathway. And you can see, again, no difference in RNA expression uh, for the E2F pathway between RPL15 overexpressing and controls. But if you look at the ribosome protected, protected fragment, there's a very, very significant increase in uh, E2F downstream signaling transcripts. So at this first level, what we would suggest is that RPL15 may be one of the components of the ribosome that actually it's known to be one of the first nucleating components of the ribosome. So it may actually trigger the coordinate increased transcription, uh, translation of ribosomal proteins, and that one of the consequences of this is that you increase translation of E2F targets proliferation, and metastasis. Now let's pause here for a while, because at this point, uh, another a postdoc in the lab, Dr. Michalisi, a Himong fellow, was actually doing a completely different study. And he was looking at uh, primary single-cell RNA-seq data that had been collected by uh, Michael Jordan and uh, Nicola Aceto of 52 different women, about 147 single cells, uh, single CTCs, and just looking at unsupervised clustering of all these single CTCs and looking at little red, red clumps, if you will. And there's this clump here, which is actually quite impressive. And if you look at what these guys are, they turn out to be all the ribosomal uh, RNAs as well. So 33% of CTCs have very high levels of ribosomal protein structural expression. The mean is about a 100-fold increase, but it goes up to even 200-fold increase over the ones that don't. If you actually then do a supervised clustering analysis where you're looking at core ribosomal proteins with low levels of, of RP expression or high level of RP expression, what you'll find is very much the similar study that we, similar results that we found in the CTC cell line. Namely, you see increased proliferation, increased hallmarks of E2F um, associated with the increased uh, RP expression. On top of that, if you look at women who, who have more than 50% of their CTCs, so some patients will have two, some patients will have 10 CTCs, 
if you divide them by which ones have more than 50% on the high, R, high RP signaling, this is their survival curve versus the blue for those that have lower, lower RP expression. So it really connotes the bad guys, the CTC subset that's correlated with a very adverse clinical outcome. Now the other interesting thing is that once you start looking at these primary CTCs from, from women with advanced breast cancer, is that not only this correlates with ribosomal proteins and E2F, it also correlates with epithelial markers. So you can see that the high RPs are high for epithelial markers. They're actually high for placoglobin. This is JUP is placoglobin. And you can see it again back to our cluster here. You can see that these things segregate together. And if you ask the question, CTC clusters tend to have very high RP content compared to single CTCs. And cells that have RP high content are more likely to be in clusters than those with low RP content. So the way we would interpret the results now are that there's an interplay between cell fate on the epithelial to mesenchymal continuum, if you will, with ribosomal expression and ribosomal content. And what we can find, if we over, we've done some experiments overexpressing RPL15 by itself with an inducible construct, and we see over that it induces higher levels of e cadherin and EPCAM expression, but not the full complement of epithelial markers. In contrast, you can also see that if you play around with EMT by inducing EMT or suppressing EMT, you can actually adjust the level of expression of ribosomal proteins. So we would, you know, again, you can, you can infer multiple different mechanisms. We would infer that this is one of the key regulations here of cancer cells as they invade into the bloodstream and as they survive and give rise to um, metastases. This is a little bit counterintuitive because we always talk about mesenchymal CTCs being the bad guys. In this case, we would argue that the more proliferative subset, the more aggressive subset, may be the epithelial cells in the context of CTC clusters. And one of the things that makes them so unique is that they seem to upregulate the translational machinery, including upregulation of proliferative um, signals, if you will, including E2F targets. How this, we're still kind of studying how this actually works. Is it just an increase in total ribosomal content, or is there actually a preferential favoritism, if you will, for some of the uh, transcripts that may have some signaling sequences that is favored by RPL15 containing ribosomes? And those are obviously complicated studies, but ones that we're embarking on at this point. So I'll leave you with this uh, kind of amazing picture of a CTC cluster, um, which again is something that we never really would have imagined if we didn't look in the blood. You know, most of our studies at this point are still focused on looking at the primary tumor or looking at the metastasis. What happens in between is actually quite transient and hard to isolate and hard to define, but it turns out to be very, very critical, and it's quite possible that a very significant fraction of the metastatic risk in a patient with cancer is actually attributable to clumps of these tumor cells that survive better in the bloodstream and can initiate a metastasis. And I'll leave you with this intriguing picture of these white blood cells, which it turns out are connected, in this case, to this, um, to this cluster. Uh, Nicola Aceto in his own lab in Basel now has actually studied expression profiles of CTCs and of white blood cells, showing a lot of interaction between them. It's not as clear as these guys attacking the, 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 the CTCs in circulation. There's actually a fair amount of crosstalk, um, as really elegantly shown by Nicola. So let me end with a thank you slide. Um, I direct my lab together with Shamla Maheswaran. We co-direct the lab together. And the folks who've done the work most, most, that I talked about mostly today is a graduate student and a PhD student, Richard Ebright, and a postdoctoral fellow, Doug Michelisi. And the ribosomal work um, and the, the profiling was done in collaboration with Charlie Lee in Shobha Vasudhavan's lab. This is a long-standing collaboration with Mehmet Toner and a whole group of fantastic bioengineers at MGH and our clinical collaborator for the breast cancer work, uh, Aditya Bardia. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Sean. 
So uh, I understood in the beginning that the microfluidic device yields cells that are about 0.1 to 1% pure for CTCs. So in order to study the heterogeneity among CTCs, how do you distinguish which 1% of the cells are CTCs? And then how do you do RNA-seq analysis comparing the CTCs? So um, it depends on what we're doing. If we're, if we're picking single cells for, for RNA-seq, we usually use a combination of cell surface markers. So we use markers against EPCAM, against CD11, against EGFR. So depending on which cancer we're picking, for melanoma it would be a whole other set. But we look, we do make a cocktail of cell surface fluorescein conjugated antibodies, and then we pick the green cells. It's once you purify them, it's actually much easier to pick them that way than it is if you use those antibodies to sort them in the first place. So the that's, well, for, for that, it's a manual step. We've also done uh, 10x sequencing, and depending on the lab budget that particular month, we can actually go through every single one. Um, and sometimes we've also picked large cells or cells that look like tumor cells. But for the work that I've shown here, there's a second step of identifying the cells based on their sur cell surface expression. The, the other thing that we've done that's much more kind of user-friendly, if you will, is to identify, and we've identified cocktails of transcripts for breast, prostate, melanoma, um, pancreatic cancer that are unique to CTCs and completely absent in blood cells. So to give you the example, you know, albumin, for example, is the most abundant protein in your blood, but if there's a cell that makes albumin RNA in your blood, it comes from the liver and doesn't belong there. So, We've curated these panels, made a digital droplet PCRs out of them. And with that, we can calibrate both tumor burden and signaling pathways without even having to look at the cells. And that turns out to be the most efficient way because then the CTC enrichment is automated and the scoring is an RNA-based molecular score as well. So, Dan, I was wondering if you know whether the clusters um, have a heavier mutational load because they're having to squeeze through these capillaries and you get uh, shearing and DNA damage. I mean, I, so it's, it's a sad story, um, but I have another brilliant MD-PhD student in biophysics who spent about a year squeezing cells. Um, and he was absolutely convinced that squeezing cells was gonna induce DNA damage. What he was able to show, and that's actually, it's already published that if you squeeze cells through a capillary, a, a narrow channel, you can break and disrupt the nucleus, and you can actually see the flow of nucleoplasm into the cell. So that's been shown. Uh, Mark Kalinich, who's the grad student who did this, tried physiological capillary pressures and did a whole bunch of analyses. What he was able to show is that there are certain diameters under normal physiological flow that's more likely to cause nuclear disruption. He used GuideSeq, which is a very nice technique for looking at breaks in DNA, um, to try, developed by Keith Young for CRISPR type applications, to see if there are parts of the genome that are more susceptible to breaks. And all he could find was that repetitive DNA, repetitive sequences break a lot, the rest, we couldn't find a difference. And in the end, he was able to convince himself and me that once you squeeze cells, they can be more tumorigenic and they can give rise to colonies in soft agar, but he wasn't able to tie it to any particular gene. So, yes, but no. The leukocytes in the clusters, where do they come from? I mean, they, they are there when the clusters leave the primary tumor, or do the leukos are the leukocytes recruited into the clusters in the circulation, and do they contribute to the survival competence of, of, the, of the So clusters? Our, our first concern is that it was an artifact of the chip, and we were able to confirm against that by having multiple colored uh, cells. The next possibility is that they get stuck in the blood. And some, some labs have proposed that, that the cells come together in the blood. If you do the math, it's so rare that that would be unlikely. Uh, but they could get together once they land in the lung. The, the most convincing result was from Nicola, where if you have a red tumor on the left and a green tumor on the right, the clusters are only one color. And that suggests that they really come from one tumor or from the other. If you stain for placoglobin in the primary tumor, it's very heterogeneous, which is interesting. So you see areas of the tumor where you have huge levels of placoglobin, other areas where there's very low placoglobin. 
So we hypothesize that there are kind of tethered areas within a tumor, and when they either migrate on their own or there's a necrotic event, they could break into the, into the bloodstream by themselves. We've tried intravital imaging, um, and it's actually, it's, it's hard to see beyond, um, I mean, you can kind of see shadows, but it's not yet convincing that you can see a whole clump falling off like an iceberg from a glacier, but that would be our best, our best suggestion at this point. Uh, two questions, very, ni very nice story. Um, in, in the context of the ER positive CTCs from the metastatic patients you have, you have generated, do you know if they are still expressing ER or if they're they responsive to estradiol or, or other treatment and the anti-endocrine treatments? So um, if, you look, if you were to get CTCs early at the time of diagnosis, they express estrog estrogen receptor and they're very susceptible and you can, you can mimic that for all different cancers. Mm -hmm. By the time we get most of the CTCs, women have been treated with multiple cycles of hormonal therapy. And then at the end, some of them still express the estrogen receptor, but they're not particularly sensitive compared to, say, MCF7 or other cells. We've been studying very much second and third generation estrogen degraders and other hormonal therapies to see if we can actually identify responsive pathways mm -hmm. for highly resistant disease. So I would say most of the cell lines that we've modeled are really, they're the ones that no longer respond to all the easy treatments and have activated things that you wouldn't have thought of, you know, if you study MCF7s. Okay, so the second question is, in their clusters, do you ever see a mixed cluster of an epithelial and mesenchymal cell in the same cluster or any proximal? I'm just wondering whether the clusters have the potential to reprogram a neighboring mesenchymal cell or an epithelial cell so hence, actually co-opt them into, into sort of metastatic phenotype. It's an interesting question. We don't have enough data by in situ hybridization, but we do have data from RNA sequencing of clusters. And we see what I think has been described here a lot is this intermediate range with some epithelial markers, some mesenchymal markers. So it's not that clusters are all epithelial, but they clearly have some epithelial markers, but they also have mesenchymal markers at the same time. Uh, Dan. Um, I'm curious about specificity. So have you compared these circulating, the high levels of these ribos specific ribosomal proteins in the circulating cells to the primary tumor and then to the site where it's going to land? Is there some, you know, is it, are they being induced during this, meta you know, in, the, in this mm. stage at which they're becoming circulating? We, we haven't done RNA sequencing of the metastases or the primaries. So the RNA sequencing data mm -hmm. in primary samples that I've showed you is all kind of individual CTCs compared to each other. So about a third of them are really high, the others not at all. And remarkably, we see this across every cancer that we've looked at. And in fact, if you now start looking at databases, it's one of those things where nobody looks at ribosomes, nobody thinks about ribosomes. Right. If you start looking at it, you will find that ribosomal expression is actually quite variable, sure. and that it, they travel to all together. So you rarely, it's not like you have three or four, it's the whole complement is up or down. And again, something that you know, was unexpected but kind of hits you once, you once you start looking at that. But do you think there are specific ribosomal proteins that are being highly expressed that's, that are going to you know, give specific tumor, specific types of cancers? high expression of certain <clears throat> transcripts, you know, is that? No, no, I, I think in our CRISPR screen, we chanced upon RPL15 because it's, it appears to be potentially a master regulator of all the ribosomal guys. So you overexpress RPL15 and everybody goes up. When you look at primary CTCs from breast cancer patients, they're all up. So we can't say that RPL15 itself is the target biologically, it just came out of the CRISPR screen as the kind of the key point for this. Hi. Hi, you mentioned that, I'm, I'm here in the back, hi. You mentioned that the CTC cell lines are of a higher ploidy. Is the ploidy C, uh, caused due to the, cha uh, the growth of the cells in culture or do you see it early on when you isolate the CTCs? Well, we don't, we don't know their ploidy at the time that they're picked, but we can look very early as the cell lines are established, and it's, it's, it's high there. But most of our data is once, once they've started to grow. I think that if you look at uh, biopsy-derived cultures, so PDXs in breast and other cancers, uh, 
you, you, see, you obviously see aneuploidy and you see increases in ploidy. So it's a clear pathway that's common as cancers become advanced. But the level of polyploidy is quite remarkable in these CTCs. And is there an understanding of why these CTCs are of high ploidy or why they are specifically of? Um... Um, there isn't. What, what we would assume is that by the time you get to this level of advanced cancer that you've gone through often five or six different regimens where the tumor shrank and then came back, you're talking about quite a few additional somatically acquired abnormalities, including ploidy. Um, in general, you know, I think there's increasing appreciation that ploidy changes, or at least comp a genome duplication happens relatively early in cancer progression. You know, getting to 6N or 8N is not that, is not that commonly seen early on. What, what's remarkable, though, I would say, is that when you get to these really advanced cancers and you're having 6N or 8N, and you're having lots of mutations, some of which are, um, you know, 50% of, of all alleles, others less, you start having the challenge of what's druggable, what's significant, what's a passenger. And I would say that's one of the biggest uses of these cells, is you find a mutation and you can test whether actually it confers susceptibility to a drug or not. All right, let's thank Dan again for a fantastic talk.